I've been preaching through the book of St. Mark. And we are now at the 15th chapter of St. Mark. We're going to read verse 1 down to verse 15. And I'm going to be talking this morning about uh, the garden and the cross. And then in two weeks, I'm going to be talking about the cross and the tomb. And so uh, there's so much in this 15th chapter of Mark that I'll probably explode before I'm done. And hopefully, I'll splatter in the right direction. Say amen. But let's stand for the reading of God's Word, St. Mark chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible with you, it is on our screen. You can follow us along. Good old King James Bible. Amen. Verse 1. And straightway, that's a Mark word, in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they have witnessed against thee. But Jesus yet answering nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them in the past, basically. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people, and he that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do with him who you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. And then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. I want to use for a subject, of course, the garden and the cross. You may be seated. It is about 5 o'clock in the morning. The rooster has crowed twice. Peter has denied his Lord in the 14th chapter. They have taken Jesus under arrest through the um, temple police and the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth. And they bring him before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jews' supreme court. And they found Jesus guilty of blasphemy, claiming to be the Christ, the Son of God. Well, he is. And he is. And he forever will be son of God. He was crucified because the Jews rejected their Messiah. And they rejected the fact that God himself would come to earth as the son of God. And so the Bible is very clear that they found him guilty under false pretense. And the... Uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, rose up and said, Blasphemy, blasphemy, this person should die. Jesus should die because he said that I am. I love the response that Jesus made to Caiaphas and the, uh, and the Supreme Court of the Israel, the Jewish Supreme Court of that time. They said, Are you the Son of God, the Christ? 
And Jesus Christ said, I am. How many know every time God says, I am, something big is about to happen? Aren't you glad for the great I am? God said it the first time at the burning bush to Moses, I am. And Moses, the great lawgiver, comes forth and Israel gets delivered. I am. And you may want to pull this down just a shade. I, I may be a little louder when I get, I'm getting excited. And, you know, when you get excited, you talk fast and you get loud. So you can pull it down some there. It'll be fine. You can leave them up here. But I don't want to torment anybody. I want you to be at, uh, hear the word of God and receive it with grace and with mercy. Amen? Now, it's about five in the morning, and they're going to get together to counsel, and they're going to decide the charges that they're going to bring against Jesus when they take him to Pilate. You see, they said that Jesus should die. But Israel couldn't kill anybody because Caesar, Rome, had taken that power of execution away from the Jews. You say, well, they stoned people, yes, but that was in the mob they stoned people. They didn't legally pronounce um, execution because they were not permitted to do so. So they took Jesus to Pilate because Pilate was the only one that could legally put Jesus Christ to death. And, of course, they wanted Rome to get the blame I mean, no, most religious people want other people to get the blame. And they went in Rome to get the blame, so they certainly didn't want to come across as these bad people that crucified the one that raised the dead and cleansed the leper and healed the sick and the good guy. Uh, they didn't want to be accused of that. Listen to me, friends. They didn't crucify Jesus Christ because he opened blinded eyes and raised the dead. They crucified Jesus Christ because they didn't want him as their Messiah. They did not believe that he was the Son of God. And so they took um, Jesus to Pilate, and uh, they had to come up with the charges that they were going to bring against Jesus Christ. And the charges, we don't like him, we don't believe him, he's not the Messiah. Pilate could really care less about that. And so they come up with three charges against Jesus Christ, and you find them in the 23rd chapter of St. Luke, verse 1 and 2. And the three charges they brought against Jesus Christ was, one, Jesus perverts the people. He perverted the nation. Number two, he forbade giving taxes to Caesar. He forbid tribute to Caesar, which is a lie. All that was a lie. You don't pervert the nation by opening blinded eyes and cleansing lepers. You don't pervert the people by blessing them. But the what it was is they considered, because their religious hold was being perverted, they thought Jesus was a troublemaker. But in truth, they were the troublemakers. And so they, they said that Jesus said they didn't ha he didn't have to pay taxes. And the third charge they brought against him was, he said, Christ, Jesus Christ said, I'm the Christ, I'm the King of the Jews. Well, I've got news for you. He's not just king of the Jews. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And they knew, they knew that if they would pronounce this judgment upon to Pilate, that he claims to be the king, then that could be a thought about insurrection, that he actually could be a, a trouble to Rome, trouble to Pilate's precinct. Now, let me first help you a little bit about the Garden of Gethsemane. We were in that in chapter 14. And you'll remember when I was preaching um, a few weeks ago about the Garden uh, of Gethsemane. And by the way, it's referred to a, uh, the Garden in, John, in, in chapter John. Uh, in John chapter 18, it's referred to a Garden. The other Gospels doesn't refer to it as a Garden, but we know it is the Garden of Gethsemane. And we need to understand that the suffering of Jesus Christ did not just begin on the cross. The suffering of Jesus Christ did not just begin on the spittle, the hitting, the brutality, the scourging. The, the suffering of Jesus Christ began in the garden. When Jesus' sweat became as great drops of blood, he had bloody sweat. 
And Jesus Christ is, well, let me put it like this, and, 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 and let me help you, let me raise your eyebrows a little bit. Let me get your thinker going. In the garden of Gethsemane, the devil was trying to kill Jesus. Now here's the, here's the clincher. On the cross, the Father was killing Jesus. On the cross, the Father was sacrificing His Son for me, for you. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise Him, to put Jesus Christ to grief. So you need to understand that spotless Lamb of God that wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, when He was hanging on the cross of Calvary, God the Father was pouring out His wrath, His judgment upon Jesus, but God saw a holy Lamb of God. God saw a perfect Son of God. God saw a perfect sacrifice, but He was beating Jesus because He was looking at you and me. God was bringing wrath upon Jesus because God was looking at the need of of our salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Redemption. Amen? In fact, the Bible says in the, in the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says in that last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that for He, speaking of Jesus, uh, of God, He, God, has made Him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. So God punished His Son so that He could receive us and give to us forgiveness. That is the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Now when you look at the Garden of Gethsemane, all the weight of the world was crushing down on Jesus. When you look at the Garden all the pain, all the sorrow, all the agony, all the bitterness, all the, all the stress, all the, uh, the powers of darkness was crushing down on Jesus. And it almost killed him. And the Bible says that God came and sent an angel and strengthened Jesus at the end of that time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that angel strengthened Jesus Christ. By the way, the Bible says that angels ministered to Jesus. Do you know what women and angels have in common? Now, you women are listening for the first time this morning. <laughs> Do you know what women and angels have in common? Here it is. Women are servants, so is angels. And understand that when Jesus was ministered to, it was only by two different people. He was ministered to by women and by angels. That's awesome. That's awesome. Men will minister. Men will do things, but they want something in return. Why? Because they're not very nice. <laughs> Got me. Shoot me. But <laughs> Women, I guarantee you, if remember when Jesus healed uh, Peter, uh, mother-in-law sick of a fever? Now, I know Peter was not the first pope, was not the first Catholic. Because Peter had a mother-in-law. And anybody that has a mother-in-law is too stupid to be a pope or a priest. Amen. But remember when Jesus healed, sick of a fever, Peter's mother-in-law, what's the first thing she did? She got up and ministered to Jesus. You find Martha ministering to Jesus. And so you find that women and angels have that heart to serve. That heart God made them to serve. Now, I want to serve. Men want to serve. But men are not servants like women. 
All the ladies are going, yep, 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 woo, woo, glory to God. And I'm not feeling so good. Because I are a man. But listen to me very carefully. And I'm going to tie this together with a man named Barabbas. And I want to talk to you about in the garden. Let me say it again. You'll understand the garden better if you'll understand the weight of the world. The weight of, of, of uh, sorrow. The weight of grief. The weight of rejection. The weight of, uh, of all the oppression and sickness and disease was on Jesus Christ. And the devil was trying to push him down and kill him. And Jesus prayed, God spare me. And the God of heaven came, according to the Hebrew writer, came and delivered him from that death and from that hour. And so we know that Jesus suffered in the garden. He suffered so bad that his sweat glands, his sweat pores in his skin began to leak blood out of the holy tabernacle of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the angel got him all fixed up and nourished up and God delivered him So that he could stand there and wait for the mob to come. Six or seven hundred people. Anywhere from three to eight hundred people would come to arrest Jesus Christ. And and, uh, Judas is bringing them along. We'll get into Judas in a little bit. Judas was bringing them along because he had got 30 pieces of silver to sell out Jesus Christ. Let me say, some of you don't like Judas. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's a whole lot of people in church and out of church that's selling Jesus for more than just... Selling Jesus for less than just 30 pieces of silver. And Judas got 30 pieces of silver, said, I'll show you where he is. And he kissed Jesus, of course. The, but they asked Jesus, uh, Jesus asked them when they all showed up with their torches burning and their swords. And, 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 and Jesus said, who do you seek? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I um, they fell flat on the ground. All four, five, six hundred of them just. Shrunk. And Judas was among that slap down. Judas gets up and comes and kisses the Lord. And the Lord says, Where comest thou, friend? Where you been, friend? And so Judas, uh, Jesus Christ said, You betray me with a kiss. And from that moment, they took Jesus into the, the Jewish um, Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin 71, minus 2, Josephus. And the Bible says that Josephus was not consenting to the death of Christ. And then you have Nicodemus. We'll get into that later on, probably next week, with the, uh, between the cross and the tomb. But... Listen to me, and I'll tie this together, and you'll you'll say, wow. You see, you need to understand that the Bible says when Judas left that upper room, when the Lord handed him that sop and said, this is the one that will betray me, and when the Bible says the devil entered into Judas, and from that hour, Jesus Christ said, go do what you've got to do and do it quickly. And from that moment, the Bible says that Judas went out, and the Scripture says, and it was night. So we know that Jesus went into the garden when it was night. And there in the night, Peter had already made his boast, and we're not going to get into that because we've already preached about the ear severed off the uh, Malchus, the high priest. And we already, talk, we already talked about uh, uh, Judas and, and Peter and his denial and all that. But I, I just want to point out something that is very dear to my heart. When Jesus Christ was taken into the council, the, the Annas, first the high priest, then Caiaphas, the, the high priest of that hour or that day, and they found Jesus Christ guilty. I love the way he responded. When they said, well, are you the Christ? He said, I adjure thee by the living God. Tell us whether you be the Christ or not. Well, right there, the high priest put Jesus under oath, and he had to be honest. And not that Jesus was dishonest. The high priest was dishonest. And Jesus had to tell him exactly what it was. He couldn't be silent. And he said, yes, I am. And hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with his holy angels. When I show up next time, you guys are going to be on trial, not me. 
And so they found him guilty. They got the charges. They're getting ready to head out. And they start going to Pilate. They take, take uh, Pilate there. And, uh, and then we understand that when Jesus went to the cross. And by the way, before the Sanhedrin sent Jesus to Pilate, they beat him. They spit on his face. They beat him. And we're not talking about four or five people beat him. We're talking 70 people, maybe more than that, 100 people. We're talking about a lot of people beat him. I don't know about you, but a nice big fella can beat someone up just one and do a pretty good job on somebody. And they beat him with their fists. And they, they covered his face and said, prophesy, prophesy. Who smotes you? Well, I mean, old Jesus knew exactly who, who uh, was hitting him. And he was beat, and blood was all over his shirt. Blood was all over his garments. And Jesus, probably his, his, his uh, uh, lip was swelled up, and, and probably his nose was broke. And someone said, I got you there. The Bible says that no bone in Jesus would be broken. Your nose don't have a bone. You ever seen the skull of a human? There's a hole right there where your nose is. And when you say he broke my nose, it doesn't mean he broke the bone. I mean, he broke the cartilage in your nose. And I believe Jesus had his nose broke. And so they took him to Pilate, and he's all bloody, and he's all beaten up. He's swollen. His eyes are probably swollen shut. He's been beat, blood all over him. And they take him to Pilate and says, he claims to be king. He told him not to pay the taxes. Don't give tribute to Caesar. He, he, he perverted the nation, perverted the people. And Pilate said, you take him. You take him away. You kill him. And they spoke up and said, we're not allowed to kill him. You have to do it. And Pilate calls Jesus into the place and uh, and as he calls him into the place of judgment, he says to Jesus, Are you a king? And Jesus Christ said, Did, you, did someone tell you that I was? Or do you say it? And Pilate says, Now wait a minute. I'm not the Jew here. And I'm not the one on trial. What did you do to make them so angry at you? And, of course, at that juncture, Jesus just quit talking. Pilate was trying to get him out of it. And uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail. If you want to find more details, you're going to find it in the 18th chapter and the 19th chapter of John. Because it gives more detail between uh, Pilate before Christ. And, and, and their Pilate is judged by Christ. It's not the other way around. And uh, Pilate is trying to find every way he can to, to get the prisoner released. Now, during that time, he comes up with um, a, a possibility that uh, he was a Galilean. And when he heard that Jesus was a, a Galilean, he sent him to Herod. Well, Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem because of the feast day, the Passover. And so he sent him to Herod thinking he's going to get out of it. And Herod wanted to watch Jesus perform miracles. Herod really wanted to see Jesus do his stuff in front of him. But Jesus wouldn't even talk to Herod. No wonder. Herod killed his cousin. Herod killed John the Baptist. I wouldn't have talked to him either. And Jesus refused to talk to him. Then they beat him. They send him back. And Herod says, I don't find any fault in this man. Pilate says, I don't find any fault in this man. There's nothing in this man worthy of death. I find in him no fault. But then, at every feast day, they were given the opportunity to acquit a prisoner, to release a prisoner, to acquit a prisoner. And the Bible says that there was a man named Barabbas. And Barabbas was guilty of insurrection, guilty of murder. He was a vile person. And so Pilate says, I can get him free by bringing Barabbas before the people, and I can bring Jesus before the people, and I will ask them, which one do you want me to release unto you? And they'll surely pick Jesus. They won't pick Barabbas. At, but you know what they did? 
the mob was persuaded by the crowd. And we're talking about, about 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning. We're talking about early morning. Most of the travelers were still in bed. Most of them were not stirring yet. They were doing things in their home. What he was doing, he was getting the, the crowd that wants to terrify the nation. We're seeing that in America right now. He wanted to get the, the, the rebel rising crowd. And so the leaders talked the crowd into um, crying out for Jesus to be crucified. And here's what you need to understand. We're talking about a mob. We're talking about uh, um, rioting. We're talking about people being uh, possessed by a foul spirit, a wicked spirit. And they begin to chant, Give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? I will scourge him and let him go. And they said, no, you won't. Because if you do this, you're not a friend of Caesar. If you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. Now let's look at Barabbas for a minute. What does Barabbas mean? Barabbas means Abba's son. Barabbas means the son of return. Now, it's interesting to understand that Barabbas means Abba's son because Abba's, Abba is a stronger word than father. Abba is daddy's son, affectionate son. And so when Barabbas was Abba's son, the son of return, Barabbas was going to be Beaten, scourged. He was going to be suffering the cruel death of the cross. See, there was three crucified that day. And there was two thieves, one on each side of Jesus and Jesus. And, and crucifixion was a long, drawn-out death. Crucifixion would last for hours and hours, sometimes four days. But the reason... The crucifixion of Jesus didn't last no four days it's because Jesus is God and He's going to get it done and Jesus is going to die at 3 o'clock at the exact moment the high priest offers the Passover lamb. And that's 3 in the afternoon. Jesus went to the cross at 9 our time and at mid uh, high noon our time Darkness came upon all the earth. And at three, the darkness went away. And Jesus announced, Teleastai, it is finished. And there, after the darkness, Jesus Christ yields his spirit to God, dies. And he's dead after six hours on the cross. You can divide that up, three hours of daylight from nine till noon, three hours of darkness from high noon till three. Um, we'll come back to Barabbas just for a minute because I, I think it's important that I, I point this out. When he was on the cross, there was three hours, that's from nine till noon. The first three hours, Jesus Christ spoke well, he actually spoke seven utterances from the cross. The first three hours, his first words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, that always bothered me in reading the Scriptures because they knew exactly what them buzzards were doing. But Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Did God hold Israel not responsible? No, God has held Israel responsible. God still holds Israel responsible. So who was he saying they don't know what to do? He's talking about the Gentile world. He's talking about the, the, the Rome. He's talking about the soldiers. They know not what they do. They know nothing about God. Forgive them. They know not what they do. And that was his first cry. His second cry was, um, 
um, mother, behold thy son. Uh, woman, behold thy son. And to the John, son, behold thy mother. The third utterance from the cross, that first three hours was today to the, he said to the thief that repented of his sins, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then there was darkness for three hours. And the darkness for three hours, in the midst of that darkness, Jesus Christ calls, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At that moment, every sin of the world was put on Jesus Christ. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. And then when the darkness began to leave, which was at 3 o'clock, or at the close of 3 o'clock, the third hour, or the, the second, third hour, he cried, I thirst. The second one, it is finished, teleastai. And then the last thing he said was, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, if you'll listen to me real carefully, I'll show you a great truth. Why was this man Barabbas the son of Abba? God so loved the world that God had a son and that son was not just his son, Jesus Christ, but God had a son that sinned in the garden. And God so loved the world. He was the love of mankind. He loved mankind. Our Abba. And so, Barabbas didn't have to go to the cross. He's the son of return. And so Jesus Christ goes to the cross so that you and I don't have to. We're the sons and daughters of Abba. God has a great affection for us. Barabbas was going to be crucified and die a cruel death. And daddy at home said, oh, I don't want to lose my son. And, and Barabbas goes home to, to his daddy uh, given uh, total freedom and given forgiveness. And I want you to know one day, one day, praise God, my name's not Barabbas, but one day, one day, this guilty child of God that once was in sin, one day, you as children of God that was once in sin, one day, we'll go home to Abba, our daddy, our father in heaven because Jesus Christ took our place. <laughs> Woo! Jesus Christ took our place and let us go free. Isn't that beautiful? Some of you are not shouting, but whoo, glory to God. Man, that's good stuff. I got to let some steam out. Whoo, awesome. God loved us so much that he made his son to be sin so that you and I, he, he knew no sin. We know sin. He knew no sin. And Jesus Christ took our hell and took our death and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now let me come back to Judas just for a minute. It says in this 15th chapter, uh, verse 1, that they came up with the charges to bring to Pilate for Jesus. Verse 2, it says, they said he claims to be the king of the Jews. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he said, thou sayest it. But sometime during the time Caiaphas the high priest took Jesus away bound, sometime during that time, according to Matthew chapter, I wrote it down here, I think it's Matthew chapter 27. Yes, according to that time, Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 through 10 Judas comes to the temple and takes the 30 pieces of silver and throws it in the floor and said, I have betrayed the blood of an innocent man. And it was at that time, you say, well, I thought Caiaphas and all the high priests were over at Pilate's giving Jesus. This is Passover time. So I think Judas uh, laid real low until the high priest was gone. And then he come in there with his silver and throwed it down in the temple to the other priests that were there attending the business because this was the feast of preparation. And he said, I betrayed innocent blood. They said, what is it to us? 
And Judas went out and hung himself. Now let me say this right now. If, you want, if you've got a spirit of suicide on you right now, if you have a spirit of suicide on you right now, it will be because you are, you've been hurt very badly and you can't cope with it. You've lost something that's very bad and you can't cope with it. Cope with it. Or you, you're, you've got a chemical imbalance that you need deliverance by the power of God. Or if you're suicidal, it could be because you're just a rotten sinner. Because the devil always takes you to the point of death. The devil always wants to kill you. And the Bible says that Judas went out and hung himself. The scripture goes on to say that when he hung himself, whether the limb broke on the tree or whether the Bible says the rope broke, uh, he falls headlong down a, a, a ravine, down a cliff, and it, and it gets up, the rocks uh, grab his belly, he rips out his intestines, he spilled down the cliff, his blood is splattered. They took the money and bought a field called the Potter's Field, called the Field of Blood, and that's where they put the people that died that were, were, that were Gentiles that did not know God or fell from God, they buried them there. Before that, it was Hinnom, a place of refuge outside the city where they burned the trash of Jerusalem, the dung and the trash. And that's where Jesus would have ended up had it not been for Joseph and Nicodemus. That's where Jesus would have ended up. But how many know God had Joseph and Nicodemus in place because the Son of God was going to die with the transgressors, but he was going to be buried with the rich. And Jesus died with the transgressors, but was buried with the rich. And you and I, if the Lord waits very long, we may die with the transgressors. All around us, there's transgressors. And if Jesus waits his return, then we may die with the transgressors. But we'll be raised with the rich. We'll be entombed with God's riches and God's blessing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody ain't shouting, but you ought to be. Amen. Now, I'm glad that I, I, I could take some scripture to you. On Sunday night, I just rant and rave. Say, so aren't you ranting and raving right now? No, come back tonight. I rant and rave on Sunday night. I don't preach verse by verse through the scriptures, through the Bible on Sunday night or Wednesday night. We just, we just kind of get together and let it rip. But listen to me. When they took Jesus Christ to Pilate, Pilate tried to find every way he could to release Jesus because he knew Jesus was not guilty. In fact, it's in the book of Matthew that Pilate's wife sent word to Pilate and said, don't have anything to do with this just person. I have suffered many things in a dream. It was in Matthew 27 that Pilate couldn't convince the people to let Jesus go. And he washed his hands in a basin of water and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. And the people of Israel cried out, let his blood be upon us and our children. And that's why Israel is in such a mess. Because... They said, let his blood be upon us and our children. I'm glad that we've got a president that has made some peace treaties with Israel. I am very thankful for the president. No matter, no matter, your, no matter your political persuasion, I am grateful that peace treaty after peace treaty has been made between Israel and the Arab world. I am grateful for that. I think it's a sign of the end time. I believe we're just about to be caught out of here faster than a speeding bullet up in the power like a rocket into the presence of God. I believe the end time is so nigh. I can taste it. I can feel it in the wind. I can sense it in my soul. I know Jesus Christ is coming any moment. Hallelujah. But listen to me. When Trump the president moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Was the begin Have you noticed how it has avalanched since then? When he made his mind that he was going to put the 
embassy there in Jerusalem. When he made that move, it changed the entire Middle East. Now, whether you like him or not, that's beside the point. I like God a whole lot more than you dislike Trump. I love God a whole lot more than you dislike Trump or some other person. And I'll say this right now. I'm not supposed to be political. Don't tell on me. I'm not supposed to be political. And if you're a Democrat, I love you either way. If you're a Democrat, I love you. God so loved the world that he died for all you Democrats. If you're a Democrat, I'm okay with that. But I'd rather paint my house with a Q-tip than to vote for Joe Biden. Come on. Come on. Are you saying, preacher, if he wins, will you paint your house with a Q-tip? No, I just said I would rather. <laughs> I know, I, I, I can't make everybody happy, and I'm not trying to. You say, obviously you're not trying to. Listen to me. When Jesus Christ went into that garden, the devil tried to kill him. All of the world and its pressure tried to kill him. But when he went to the cross, he was beaten by the Sanhedrin. And he was beaten by others. And he was tortured by others. But when he went to the cross, he was beaten by his father. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. You can find that in Isaiah 53. So I can't believe that God poured out His wrath on His Son. Wait a minute. Barabbas has a daddy. And daddy loves Barabbas. And God the Father, our Abba, has a son. Not just the Son of God, but sons and daughters, you and I. And our Father loves you and I. And so Jesus took our place. Come on. I said, I said Jesus took our place so that we can go to heaven. We deserve to be scourged. We deserve to die. We deserve to go to hell. We deserve to be crushed. We deserve to lose it all. But God didn't come to give us what we deserve. God came to show us His mercy and His grace and to show us that love sees no boundaries. Love has no walls. Love has no limitless, limitlessness in power. God so loved the world that He crucified his son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Oh, I apologize for getting a little too loud, but I got excited. Please forgive me. I said, well, preacher, I don't like a salat. You shouldn't have walked into a Pentecostal church. They can't even give the weather forecast without getting excited. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. I'm saved. And I'm forgiven of my sin. Because there was a Barabbas, a son of Abba, the son of return. And the Son has returned. And I will return to my Father who gave me life. Because Jesus came to me and took my place and gave to me eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Well, I've got to stop there. 
I've got a whole lot more I could say, but we're going to pick up next week or next, actually in two weeks. I'm going to be gone. Josh is going to be preaching, and uh, he'll be taking care of things. I'm going down to Tucson, Arizona. I'm going to head out tomorrow. So in two weeks, I'll be talking about the cross and the tomb. And I'm going to talk to you about what happened between the death of Jesus and his resurrection. There's not much preaching about that. But I'm going to talk to you about what happened from the death of Jesus to his resurrection, from the, from the cross to the tomb. And I'm going to talk to you about more about the cross and the, and, uh, the praetorium that was the, the, the uh, soldiers beat Jesus. They beat him to an inch of his life. I'm going to talk to you about Simon the Cyrenian. By the way, Simon the Cyrenian became a great Christian. In fact, his son Rufus is mentioned by Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13. Where is it? No, Romans chapter. Oh, man, it's Romans uh, chapter 13 around verse 6, I think. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe verse 13. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll get that straight before next time. I'll get that straight on the way to Tucson and back. But Rufus was a child of God. And everybody knew that Simon the Cyrene was the father of Rufus and Alexander. And so Mark knew that the people would know who he's talking about. And so it's important that we understand uh, when Paul gave the benediction toward the last part of, of uh, Romans. It might be Romans 16, 13. But anyway... Uh, we'll get it straight. And uh, is it Romans 16, 13? Thank you, Jerry, for getting me out of hot water. Deliverance from the second row. Thank you very much. But we're going to talk about between the cross and the tomb. And I hope I can share with you about did you know that Jesus did actually carry his cross? Some people teach that he never carried his cross. Jesus did actually carry his cross. And I'm going to show you in the scriptures that he not only carried his cross at the start, when they chose Simon the Cyrene to help carry it, he was carrying it at the end when he reached the hill of Golgotha. John says he was carrying it when he reached the end of Golgotha. That Jesus was. And so, there was a lot of things that transpired. But, please hear me. Jesus took our place. And if you die without Christ, if you die without giving your honor to the Son of God, you have no defense. If you die without serving God, you have no defense. And if the, if the Lord returns in the catching away of the church, even now while I speak and you're left behind, you have no defense. Because God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And all it takes is for us to say, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I released Jesus in my heart and Jesus ran out everything that didn't belong there. Did you know if Jesus lives in someone's home, I'm talking about at your residence. If Jesus lives in your home, some of your pagan relatives don't even like to visit you. Hello? You get ready to pray over the meal at Thanksgiving and there's always that bunch around the table. That's already eat a half a turkey leg before you started asking the blessing. <laughs> Amen? Like the little boy that went into a restaurant, I think he was in Texas, and he took his little hat off, and everybody started eating, and just eating, and just eating, and just eating. And he said, you guys, didn't you ask prayer before you ate? And they said to the little fella, around here we just dig in. And the little fella says, so do the hogs at my daddy's farm. (laughs) 
Don't misunderstand me. I've been one of them little feeder piggers. A little feeder, feeder pigger at the buffet. I heard someone telling on the news the other day, well, there is no more pizza buffets. Yes, there is. I don't know what happened to the states that took this thing plum out of proportion. There are states out there that don't let no buffets exist because they're afraid of this COVID-19. But I want you to know I'm more afraid of starving to death than I am COVID-19. And I heard them talking about there is no buffets in their state. No pizza buffet. Oh, Lord, surely our Lord draweth nigh. No buffet. No pizza buffets. Our Lord draweth nigh. And I got to thinking, wait a minute. We've got one in Ozark. Godfathers. And they're just going to the buffet and getting all the pizza they want. You didn't know you were going to hear a commercial for Godfathers. But they'll give me a... I'm going to send them a clip of this so they'll give me a free meal. But anyway. I hope you got something out of today. And, and next sun, uh, in two Sundays, it'll be more intense. And we're going to deal with more of what's happened. And we're going to deal with things that is incredible. And uh, I trust that you learned from the scriptures today. And uh, come back tonight. Come back tonight and we'll, we'll preach and we'll sing some old hymns and we'll get happy and we'll have a good time. And not, that we, not that we ain't had a good time today, but come back tonight and we'll just have a great time singing and praising the Lord. And uh, I'll try to do some preaching. Amen. But I, I like this verse-by-verse -verse stuff. I really do. I like this. I like this learning the scriptures. I really do like it. I enjoy learning the scriptures. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, Don, did I keep you awake? He, t he, he told me, he said, don't be boring and sleepy. Well, he didn't use the word boring, but I knew what he was saying. And so I'm, I'm excited about the return of Jesus. Amen? And if you've got a problem with me being a little political today, then like it, lump it, get under the pew and bump it for all I care. Let me say right now, BLM is an evil, wicked group of people. Does black lives matter? Yes, but that bunch don't matter. They ought to be put in jail. Rioters. That's what happened at the crucifixion of Jesus, rioters. People lose good sense. They lose any sense they have when people try to stir them up to do wrong and do evil. And I made this statement once before, and I won't make it again. There is some attraction in evil. There, and, and unless you understand what I'm saying, there is an attractiveness to some evil. And I don't mean it's attractive in its result. I mean that there's a luring to evil. I want to invite you today, if you don't know Christ, if you haven't given Jesus your all, I'd like for you to come to this altar and ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask God to let you be a Barabbas set free, that your Abba, Father in heaven, has sent His Son to deliver you. Altar's open, you come.